All right, so we just got done watching the live stream for the AMD Zen 3 architecture. Uh, and I, we got a lot to talk about today. So if you're a fanboy of either Intel or AMD, you're probably gonna be interested in this because it seems like this is going to be a really fun time over the next few months when it comes to CPU desktop gaming performance. Having trouble figuring out the right parts for your next build? Then the custom PC builder at microcenter.com is just for you. Microcenter's free custom PC builder tool guides you through choosing the correct components from start to finish and ensures maximum compatibility for a trouble-free installation. Smart search features allow you to customize your build based on anything you wish, including price, features, and store availability. And once you're ready to purchase, the items in your cart will be reserved and ready for pickup at the Microcenter store of your choice. Not sure which parts are right for you? Well then head to Microcenter's community forums for help and advice from other PC enthusiasts like yourself. To get started planning your next build and to check out the free custom PC builder tool, head to the link in the description below. All right, so the Zen 3 5000 series architecture, um, I'm glad that they called it 5000 series. It would, one of the things I think that is terrible for new gamers and new builders is to try and make sense of a naming scheme that is just mixed between two different architectures. And what I mean by that is obviously 4000 series was where they debuted Zen two and a half technically on uh, laptops and then 5000 series being a brand new in socket upgrade for uh, Zen 3. So we'll start off with that in socket. What does that mean? Well, that means that you don't need a new motherboard above either the X570 or the B550 that you may currently already have to take advantage of the new CPU. So if you went ahead and upgraded to an X570 motherboard when the 3000 series CPUs came out, guess what? Full upgradability for you with these new CPUs without having to have any sort of a trade-off in terms of compatibility, uh, which is often the case when it comes to Ryzen. Sometimes you could have a generation old motherboard and get the new CPU, but you leave off some of the feature sets that require the new chipset to fully take advantage of. That's not the case this time around. So you can rejoice if you've got a B500 or 550 or an X570 motherboard to have full compatibility with the CPUs. Now I believe the X470s will also have some sort of uh, capability to run these CPUs. Don't quote me on that yet. We'll have to get full um, confirmation on what will and won't be included on functionality with 5000 series CPUs on a 400 series chipset. Um, but it looks like that may be the case also. So one of the things that they really set off to do with Zen 3 is to increase the IPC and the efficiency of the same process. So it is still on TSMC seven nanometer process. So what we're gonna see here and what we're gonna talk about is an uplift of basically just efficiency and manufacturing improvements on something that is currently existing, which makes this, I guess, that much more um, impressive, if you will. They are still on track for their five nanometer process coming on their Zen 4, which if, our, if we look at the timeline since 2017 till now, tells us that we can look forward to that probably sometime around next fall, which is kind of great to see these annual uplifts in terms of uh, performance and process. It's almost like TikTok is back again, only it's AMD doing it this time, while Intel sits around with its thumb up its butt trying to figure out where they went wrong. So they're touting significant IPC uplift, that's instructions per clock. That is the amount of instructions that can be handled with the same clock speed. So one of the things that's important to talk about here is there's going to be this fanboy argument that is going to take place every single time. And that is gonna be, but Intel has higher clocks, but AMD has more instructions per clock. It's not directly comparable in that, let's say the 10900K has up to 5.3 gigahertz single thread performance versus the up to 4.9 gigahertz on the 5950X, and we'll talk about the stack in a sec, on AMD. The actual instructions per clock difference between both of them is very significant, meaning that 4.9 is gonna perform like a much faster clock just with the amount of instructions that they're doing at the same clock speed. The up, IPC uplift we're seeing is about 19% on the 5900X. Now the 5900X is what they're considering their new flagship CPU. So let's talk about the way that the architecture was up until now, because they've kind of changed the way that the core complex works today. So you have up to, you have four cores per CCX, and a CCX which, which was the core arrangement, and then the cache that it had access to. And then that's why Intel would have that stupid joke of, but they're glued together with the Infinity Fabric. That aside, what Lisa Sue was saying, and it makes sense, is it allowed them to have amazing yields because they weren't trying to make a giant core architecture and then have terrible yields in terms of the wafer waste. So what they're able to do on the seven, seven nanometer process was have a bunch of smaller wafer uh, chiplet designs, which they then connected via the CCXs and the Infinity Fabric. But obviously they're getting better manufacturing process now because they've been doing it long enough. 
Uh, seven nanometers has been around long enough to where they're getting much better yields, to where now instead of having four cores having access to 16 megabytes of L3 cache and then having multiples of those all have to intercommunicate, they've recognized the fact that when it comes to gaming, there's usually a dominant world thread. That dominant world thread was always gonna have access to about half the L3 cache that it could really wanna have access to because of the way the CCX designs were. Now with the new core complex, they have eight cores with access to the entire 32 megabytes of L3 cache. And that's one of the ways they're able to get such good uplifting gaming performance because that single world thread is now having access to double the cache. And all of the cores have access to the entire amount of the L3 cache. So as that world thread is bouncing around, it's not bouncing between other CCXs, which then increases latency because of the fact that it has to be handed off through the Infinity Fabric to a different CCX and then access to that different L3 cache, which is also handed off. That all creates latency. And if you can think about the fact that all of that was happening with the performance we were seeing with 3000 series Ryzen, you can imagine how much faster it's going to be and how much more responsive it's going to be with all of the cores on the new core complex having access to the entire L3 cache when it's handed off. So you're going to have much faster interconnect communication between the cores because it's a much more traditional layout now than it was before. But what's, a, what's really uh, kind of interesting about this is the fact that they were still able to get 19% IPC uplift and pro probably very much to do with the way that that L3 cache is now being accessed. They're advertising up to 2.8 times more efficient than 10900K. But the fact that they've achieved all of this and they're still on the same seven nanometer design, uh, which is really, <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is the second iteration of their seven nanometer, not plus, 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 like the, like the competition. Um, they're seeing an average of 26% improvement at 1080p when they average all of their game suites together. Now, sometimes they saw zero performance uplift versus uh, Intel on certain games. Sometimes, I think the lowest we saw was a minus 3%, but that's how they're able to see up to 26% uplift of uh, gaming performance at 1080p. But that IPC, that uh, efficiency, that a little bit additional core clock we're seeing now, which is up to 4.8 gigahertz single thread on the 5900XT or 5900X or 4.9 gigahertz on the 5950X. Um, at 1080p shows that they are, it was pretty obvious that there was some bottlenecking happening on AMD at 1080p. We've talked about it before. AMD fanboy said that we're haters, that's not true. Them saying that they're seeing a 26% improvement over their own previous generations. Remember, that was over previous gen that they were showing, not Intel. They were comparing that to uh, Ryzen 3000 series, seeing a 26% improvement at 1080p. So you can see now that there is a, there was indeed a, a bit of a bottleneck happening at 1080p on their own architecture. But if we talk about the IPC, they did run Cinebench R20 single core versus the 10900K, 631 versus a 544. Now the 544 is pretty similar to what we were seeing on our 10900K. So I, I have no reason not to believe these numbers. 631 is insane. Let's just say 4.8 gigahertz single core versus Intel's 5.3 gigahertz single core or up to. Now remember Cinebench does take much longer to run than the uh, Intel turbo clock speed is allowed to run. But 631 score for single core at about 500 megahertz disadvantage for at least a portion of the test is really, really significant. Now, this is an AVX instruction as well. So there is an AVX instruction offset in Intel, which is probably about 200 megahertz uh, reduced. So it's probably running at more like 5.1. That just shows that AMD is really quickly catching up to Intel in terms of uh, that clock speed, but they have clearly surpassed Intel on multi-threaded performance. They have clearly surpassed Intel on IPC and core density. It's, it, there was a promise in, in 2017 when Ryzen first launched that we were gonna see a Ryzen age like fine wine. That was their exact statement. And I think that that's exactly what we're getting here, which is what we desperately need in this industry. It's kind of funny. I've talked about in previous videos how the reason why Radeon is having such a hard time catching up to NVIDIA is NVIDIA never became complacent and stopped innovating and just continued to push their own boundaries. NVIDIA was only competing with itself and NVIDIA has enough pride to where it can't lose to itself. So it constantly kept moving forward. And this is what AMD has done to Intel. AMD has continued to innovate. 
AMD started getting back market share and beating the competition. And rather than saying, guys, we did it, mission accomplished, it was keep going, keep going, keep going. Now Intel's the one that's having to play catch up. In fact, it's kind of sad. One of the things that I've, I've always talked about, I hate that brands do, is right when someone's getting ready to announce something, they'll, they'll kind of pop up with their head and say, hey, don't forget about us. We got nothing to talk about, but we're still here. And that's exactly what Intel did yesterday, where their CEO put out a blog post, a blog post about uh, Rocket Lake coming out in 2021. We got a new thing coming. We're not gonna tell you anything about it. And then they say, we're the industry leader in gaming. Oh, I think this is one of those things where if you keep telling yourself a lie long enough, you start believing it. Intel, you got your work cut out for you because I think Lisa Sue is, <laughs> Lisa Sue is someone you never anticipated having to deal with. And she really came in here and has righted the ship with AMD. And watching this keynote also felt extremely professional where previous keynotes for AMD felt very juvenile in, the fonts, all the way down to the fonts used. It just felt like, who are you guys talking to? 13 year olds? No, I feel like it's business and they let their product do the talking. I, I, you would have to be a raging Intel fanboy to not look at this architecture and look at what is being touted. And of course you need to watch independent benchmarks like we say with GPUs and CPUs, you need to watch the independent third party tests to see how these truly scale. But I can tell you the last several generations of Ryzen uh, and by several generations, I mean like the 1.5 and then the Zen 2 and all that have lived up to the promises. There's been some issues along the way. There's been some growing pains where I think some of the mother motherboard manufacturers in terms of bio stabilities and stuff like that, which is always gonna happen. But I think they've delivered on that promise every time. And I have no reason to believe they're not gonna do that this time. And I'm really excited to get my hands on it. I'm in the middle of doing a new personal rig and I'm quite a bit torn on what platform I wanna go with. I'm kind of thinking I'm, I might still do Intel in my personal build only because I don't want my Ryzen CPUs to be tied up in a system that gets used a couple of times a month going to waste when we can do fun things with them around here in the studio. That's not all though, the, the 5950X, if you're one of those people that's like, look, if you would shop for a, 39, a 3090 graphics card, then you would also shop for a 5950X because it's a 16 core 32 thread desktop processor, the same as the uh, 3950X, but it's up to 4.9 gigahertz so close to that five. I just want to see a five so bad on AMD. 72 megabytes of L3 cache, 72 megabytes of L3 cache and still staying at 100 and watt, uh, 105 watt TDP. Like what kind of voodoo magic are they doing? But in terms of pricing, the 5950X comes in at 799. That's their highest tier flagship for the mainstream. To go higher, you'd have to go with like Threadripper, which is funny now because this just destroys any Threadripper from previous especially first gen. If you're on like a 1900, a 1950X, I am sorry. 549, you've got the 5900X, which is the one that really you should consider if you're a high-end gamer and content creator. I think that's gonna be the best bang for your buck. 449 for the 5800X, and then 299 for the 5600X. And then I'm sure we'll see some other sprinklings in there. So I'm kind of curious, what are you guys gonna do? Are, are, are you guys that are sitting on the older Ryzen gonna upgrade? Because if you're sitting on a um, first gen, obviously, or anything older than a 400, uh, 470X, you're gonna need a new motherboard. And I would highly recommend if you're gonna get a third gen Ryzen, get yourself a 500 series motherboard, get a B550 or an X570, that way you can take full advantage of the PCI Express 4.0 uh, and, and, and the other um, efficiencies that are built into the motherboards to handle these particular CPUs and all that they're designed to do. Because remember, if you have an older gen Ryzen motherboard, the core counts have scaled up quite a bit too over time. And you wanna make sure that the power delivery system is able to handle the up to 16 core 32 thread without having any sort of a power delivery issue. Um, there you go, guys, that's what we've got so far. We can expect to see these CPUs probably in the next uh, few weeks on reviews. Availability is November 5th. I'm kind of surprised they're making us wait a whole month, but uh, regardless, I'm sure you'll see reviews uh, making their way whenever the embargo lifts, you guys will start seeing those. So sound off down below. Now that we are seeing this be the like fall to end all falls when it comes to hardware in a year that has just sucked, at least making this, you know, something to look forward to. I'm curious as to what your guys' PC building plans are. Are you gonna upgrade? Are you building a new system? What platform are you going with? Are you gonna wait until next year and hope that Intel comes out with another 14 nanometer process CPU? Or are you gonna actually just say, this is the time, 
I move to Team Red and go with AMD. More than 25% market share now in Steam for the first time in a very, very long time, showing that Intel is slowing and AMD is not stopping moving forward. It's probably the most fanboy statement I think I've ever made, but I am a fanboy of PC Master Race. I love all PC components. I love all my PC children equally. 